When people think about Mangere, they think about poorer families, they think about crowded housing, they think about poverty. And so I was really challenged at how the world saw the world I was raised in, because my world was very vibrant, was very colourful, was very collective, was very resilient, you know, was really together and united. Brothers and sisters, keep your I'm really blessed to be from South Auckland and to be still doing the work there with our community and to be in a place that I was raised in and I call it my dupuanga, where my roots are, because um, dupu means to grow and anga and character. I'm Emeline Afiaki Mafaleo, and you know, I'm of Tongan, Māori, and Samoan descent. I'm a social entrepreneur, so I'm really involved in enabling communities to be able to fulfil their full potential. I've been part of that process through my own companies, which is Affirming Works and Fofola Consultancy, our community cafes, and our coffee business, Dupuanga Coffee. Innovation to me has always been um, actually allowing myself to be in diverse worlds and discomforted. And I think the cross section of that breeds innovation. So I speak at social entrepreneurial conferences and I start with I'm Māori, Tongan and Samoan. And just that alone breeds innovation. <laughs> She speaks at many different um, conferences and the fact that we were able to have her here this morning um, is a blessing for us. We go back to high school, so we had the typical rivalry between Ōtara and Mangere, um, and then also typically Samoan and, and, and Tonga. I went and did social work as a response to my best friend passing away. She passed away um, with a type of cancer, and I thought I would look after youth with life-threatening illnesses. And I ended up looking after youth and then hundreds of youth a year through designing mentoring programs, which really I felt were still life-threatening. You know, I was, I was mentoring teenage prostitutes, um, you know, people that were, have, had been heavily abused. I had been mentoring um, young offenders, gang-related. Um, yeah, lots of young people that I just loved on and then I trained other mentors to help. The last time I came back to this building was actually um, to farewell my best friend, Susan. She was half Cook Island, half Tongan, and she was buried here in Papatoi, and her funeral was in this building. I was with her in her last days and actually was there when she passed away. <laughs> and um, closed her eyes and, yeah, I, I was this, like, 18-year-old kid. And I put my head down and I read my first book at 19. I have three degrees now. I put my head down and my life just changed. I read a book and then I read another one. I did an essay and then I did another one and things just changed. When I was 25 years old, I set up this organisation called Affirming Works, a programme for young people. And we've designed a number of programs from primary school to intermediate to high school. And we've been mentoring over 300 families per year. So we've done over, uh, we actually stopped counting after 8,000 families. I tell um, the young Pacific people I'm mentoring, you know, it's really good that you individuate from your family. You know, I get, I get that we're one. You know, I get that wherever we go, we're one with family, but there's some things like for you to grow you need to kind of individuate from that experience. And so that pushes them outside that invisible ceiling. It actually breaks that invisible ceiling of some of the limitations our family can put on us as Pacific people. And when they're through that ceiling, then they bring the family with them. Young Free Basifika is about exploring, embracing and empowering. It's to explore their culture and their identity, embrace who they are and where they're from, and then use that to empower their communities. Young Free and Pacifica 2017, let's go! I touch the blood, the sweat,
sweat, the tears on the factory floors. I worry that my parents will never be content. I cry that I am never enough. I am Samoan and hopeful. I understand my gender was never a first option at leadership. I say that we should be the first option at leadership. Yeah. Do you agree with me? Yeah. Yeah. We have five creative workshops running simultaneously. Uh, so we have spoken word, art, drama, dance, and music. and then the speaker, the theatre, then the speaker. And we had a I love that there's this young team. I love that I sit amongst them and, you know, they've all played a significant part in growing me, shaping me, and I hope vice versa. And then be bold and then be brave. Mm. <laughs> What's happening tonight is a programme called Basifika Power Up. It's a Ministry of Education sponsored program nationwide. We welcome students just to open up a space for them to come and um, get support. The kids get food, um, it's, all, it's a free program, but it is a safe um, and comfortable space. A lot of the young people that come through our programs have um, amazing talent, but I see Affirming Works and the Dupuanga programs as a real platform for them to help realise that or unleash that. We also have Gaenga Duumalia. That's a prevention to family violence. It translates to prosperous families. And we use a faith-based approach. We've taken 20 families on retreats for three days at a time. And then we follow them up for three months. And we've got families that we're still working with from four years ago. Actually, we've done 140 families the last three years. Always father and mostly will dish it out to the same Vincent the poor people. For fala, fala, ai tala noi kainga. Just simply roll out the mat, invite your family onto the mat to speak. And I've done a lot of work in our community um, with that conceptual framework, which really is just the take on what my father did. He would roll out this mat in our family and he would come down to our level and he would invite us to speak. Being New Zealand born, I didn't realise that, um, I don't want to say divide, because it's an element of respect, the whaka appa appa between the tongue and father and their children. <laughs> so there's not a lot of talking to the children, you know, from the father. Um, the mother does a lot of talking because she does the nurturing in a typically Tongan family. And not a lot comes from the father. But my father was very much involved in nurturing our development. Dad was our church leader, community leader. He then um, taught Sunday school, so I taught Sunday school, and then he took youth group, so I took youth group, and I just thought it was just natural to give all your time <laughs> to all those projects. I completely get the growth I've experienced <laughs> through being married, <laughs> and through being married to someone so different. He's Tongan born, um, English was a second language, the values that I talk about, he lives out, you know, so family first and communities. And so he's really shown me how to value community in new levels. I think we appreciate what each of us bring to the equation. It's never on my own. I think I take a lot of credit for his hard work. <laughs> and we're actually also beginning to appreciate what our children bring, despite how young they are. You know, they're, they're open, like, we for follow the fala everywhere we go. I said to Albert, why don't we set up Affirming Works as a cafe so the community can come to it? They'll find out that we're a social service agency, you know, this Affirming Works. So that's exactly what we did. Albert did all the baking, <laughs> the cooking. I came up with the menu. He laughs because he goes, you have the ideas, but I have to do it. <laughs> so he did all this work and people came into this cafe and Albert would sit with them and then they'd come back the next day and they'd bring a friend and then we would create all these activities. And we mentored 300 kids that year with no government funding, but we had this full, vibrant cafe. It was church and sports club and council and cafe all crossed together. I 
And so Community Cafe birthed out the coffee kiosk in the Otahu train station, which is Fale Coffee. So my husband and I went to Tonga. Um, we were fortunate one weekend, the coffee business was for sale. And we thought, wow, this is a good investment. So we remortgaged our home, we bought the coffee business, and um, we thought it would take us a few weeks to set up. It took us three years. We pay an ethical rate, and we see pickers rebuild homes, you know, um, put their power on, um, pay for their kids' schooling, because they're getting paid consistently and at a living wage. And that's transformational for us, because they're doing it for their families, we're not doing it for them. And then we introduce the chips and then the cafe, which then opened up agritourism, and then we do coffee tours. And that just brings a cash flow in every day for them. You know, in Tonga, we don't have much resource there. That everything break down, I'll become like um, <laughs> mechanic and uh, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. I, if the coffee machine break down, I have to stay up all night to fix it. Yeah. And if our roast starts to go down, same thing. <laughs> the coffee is named Dupuanga. It's named after the mentoring program. It's shipped here and donated to our cafes and helps with the mentoring services and affirming works. When I wrote the Pacific Youth Development Strategy, <coughs> yeah. I had over eight CEOs of government departments in the room and then I had eight to ten community leaders. First time they sat in a room. The fifth company that I run is Fofola Consultancy, which is myself as a consultant in policy and development. And through Fofola Consultancy, I've been able to train other people to grow social enterprises and to grow businesses. And most of that has just come from my own personal experience. How have you fitted all that? I just actually think it's my new norm, because my husband and I homeschool our three boys. And they travel with us, and so I don't actually call it juggling. Because it's my new norm, I just feel like it's quite fluid. And because I've got this amazing community that we've been able to mobilize, and I think that's the key. She's a powerhouse woman. You know, she's a really amazing advocate for her community. And um, her being a mother and a woman, an entrepreneur, it's really um, inspirational. She's done some wonderful work with our community and, and she's developed frameworks of engagement for, for Pacific people, you know, for La Fala. We roll out the mat and there's a safe space for our people. In our culture, man is um, almost uh, um, um, be the head. And it's not mean that being the head that you um, overrule and over control everything. And you know, whatever my wife wanna do something, she's 100% supporting what she does. And, and whatever I do, she always behind me too. It's like a, a lift of spiritual poverty. Like, I, I don't want to see people in despair or depressed or feeling like they can't get out. So I don't judge situations because I think that there's layers upon layers of complexities and it's not like a material issue. It's not a material issue around poverty. But I think there's cycles, generational cycles that need to be broken. and acceptance of self that needs to be made so that they can feel confident that they have the hope that they can get themselves out of their own despair. So, you know, I think that's probably the reason I do what I do. <laughs> Tēnā koutou irirangi te motu i te pūtia tautoko kā rawe.